Good afternoon, folks. This is Kathy Barrett um, with Cornell's Pro Dairy Program. Thanks for joining us this afternoon for our winter calf care webinar, Baby, It's Cold Outside. So uh, today I have uh, Dr. Jerry Bertoldo with us. Um, he's a veterinarian and a regional specialist with both Pro Dairy and the Northwest New York um, Cooperative Extension Team. So um, we're going to kind of go step by step through some of the things that uh, you might, might want to consider for winter calf care. But before we get started, I just had a couple of uh, things I wanted to um, uh, talk to you about as far as how we work these webinars. If you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself. We have a small enough group that we can do that. So please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Or if you're uh, not comfortable doing that, you can go ahead and put your questions or comments in the chat box as we go through. And then um, as we are, we're going through the uh, presentation, we'll stop, look at the chat box and, and answer some of your questions. So um, please feel free to do that. It always makes the uh, presentation a little more interesting if we get some back and forth. Um, the other thing is I wanted to let you know that we are recording this presentation so that later folks who couldn't make it at this time and place could um, go ahead and access it from the Pro Dairy website. So we are recording it and in the next day or two, um, it'll be up on the Pro Dairy website. So those just are a couple of things there. So, Jerry, we ready? We're ready. Okay. <laughs> so we want to go ahead and uh, kind of... Uh, There we go. Oop, do we need to go back one? Yeah, here we go. So we wanted to um, cover this afternoon, just in this half hour, 45 minutes, some of the things that are uh, the challenges that are presented during the colder weather in these winter months. And um, really already today, it's cold enough so we, we need to be starting to think about our calves, what their needs are going to be, and how to kind of be, get ahead of the, um, the, the, the challenges that the winter time brings. So today we're going to talk a bit about um, nutritional needs of the calves, how they're increased during this cold weather period, how about, about maintaining water intake, keeping calves warm and dry, out of drafts, as well as cleanliness and how to manage health during this period of time. So why don't we go ahead and uh, get started first with the nutritional challenges. So like Jerry, why don't you kind of talk a little bit about this? Yeah, the, the biggest challenge we have uh, with these younger calves, since their body mass is so small and they tend to lose uh, heat more than an adult, uh, is that as temperature goes down and we get beyond what's called their thermal neutral zone where they don't need extra energy to keep warm, uh, we dilute out uh, some of the needs uh, that they have for, for maintenance and growth and uh, try to put that into to keeping warm and, and such. So the Things that work in the summertime uh, for calves where they grow pretty well, whatever your goal is, pound and a quarter, pound and a half, two pounds a day, uh, when the temperature gets down pretty cold, you're not going to get near that kind of weight increase because of the diversion of uh, energy, particularly to keeping the calf warm. Right. And, it, you know, it ha happens, you, you sort of start to see these effects probably sooner than we feel them as, as human beings. So, you know, calves that are just um, that are less than three weeks of age, you know, if it gets below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which isn't terribly cold, already you're starting to see that kind of um, effect of cold weather on them. So it's not drastic at, at you know, 59 degrees, but it starts there. They really, you know, a young calf got a lot of uh, body fat on it. At three weeks, you know, up until that period of time, you know, cold weather has a, has a pretty uh, dramatic impact on them. You know, uh, uh, Jerry and I were talking earlier, and he was saying how, you know, when a calf is born in good weather, right, it's uh, like 18 hours? At, at most, as far as the, um, the fat reserve, yeah, the, the brown fat that newborns have, it's not very plentiful in calves, and uh, maybe 18 hours most on, a, on good weather, it's warm. But when the when temperature is really cold, and before these calves get anything to eat, that brown fat maybe only lasts a few hours. So it's really important to get that first feeding the colostrum in these calves early. We think about it for the, the IgGs, the antibodies that's in it, but it's truly the energy and nutrient packed uh, as well, something that we don't think about as much in colostrum. Yeah. 
And then the three weeks is kind of a transition period there. They can take a little bit colder weather, but still 42 degrees. So not freezing, you know, really at 42, you start thinking about, well, okay, uh, you know, are, are we meeting their needs for both maintenance and then for, um, for them to grow, of course, and, and be healthy as well. And uh, you know, um, and this, of course, this is, you know, we're talking about these temperatures, but, you know, if it's windy out, if it's wet out, we all know cold, wet days feel colder and uh, are colder when then um, someone just says the, the temperature for the, for the area. Yeah, wind chill matters. Uh, yeah, guys. right, yep. right. And so, Jerry, what happens in three weeks? You were telling me earlier, so there's like physiology there that happens in three weeks there's, that makes the difference. Um, it, it may be the fact that metabolism is changing a little bit. Uh, there's some not very much impact as far as the rumen starts to do some things and certainly older animals the rumen is kind of a, a nice uh, furnace to keep keep them warm but it's more of a metabolic change in these calves at, at around three weeks that uh, allows them to uh, do okay without extra energy at lower temperatures okay so you know we're, we're talking here about okay it's going to get cold Young calves under 60 degrees, you start to see this impact. Um, uh, older calves, 42 degrees. So what can we do? You know, uh, we already are seeing those temperatures now. Today it's like about 40 here in, uh, in Canandaigua. But, you know, it's going to get colder yet. So we kind of wanted this webinar to start to have folks thinking, okay, so what can we be doing right now and what do we ought to be thinking about in the next few months? So first and foremost, you know, when we're talking about nutrition, talk to your nutritionist, but do it now. Don't wait till you're <laughs> freezing cold out and think, hmm, these kids aren't something to be doing as well. So, you know, get ahead of it. Talk to your nutritionist now and start to kind of figure out what strategies you can put in place so that as the, the temperature drops, your calves aren't impacted negatively. So a couple of things to kind of keep in mind. So increase the volume at each feeding. Always, always a good thing, though we do have uh, biological limitations when we feed just twice a day, particularly if we don't feed 12 and 12, which very few people feed their calves at 7 in the morning, 7 at night, doesn't work with the work schedule so well. So we're really kind of limited if they get fed at 7 in the morning and 4.35 in the afternoon. Uh, we can only handle so much volume at a, at a time. So. Uh, the three time a day thing. I know years ago when I was in vet practice, I suggested this to some people in the middle of winter, and I thought I had two heads and you know four eyes. <laughs> and you know how are you going to do this? Well, when you're losing 15% of your calves because it's so cold and they they can't can't eat enough or they scour badly if you feed them too much, uh, three times a day uh, is actually coming into play in in a bunch of herds out our way in Western New York, and it's working out pretty well. Uh, mostly larger farms where got enough staff morning, noon, and night, and you can have a, a nighttime person who pushes cows, maybe feed the calves. And so those three times a day, so it's during, you know, day, daylight hours, right? You know, so how would they? Well, like, yeah, that doesn't work so yeah. well. Again, you run into the bio, biological thing. If you're feeding, say, it's 7 in the morning, even maybe 6, 7 at night, and you decide to put a third feeding in in the middle of the day, you really haven't, uh, that morning feeding hasn't completely gone away. So... There's only a certain limit to how much you can feed midday. It's better than uh, feed a little bit more and do it in the middle of the day uh, than to say, well, twice a day is all I can really do. Uh, so it's kind of a halfway step between 2x and 3x. So um, Jerry was talking about three times a day, having to have the, to, how to divvy that up so that the, uh, the calf can actually consume that much. You know, it's just it's only takes so much volume. Particularly in that first week, 10 days, even the intensified feeding folks will get up to 11, 12, 13 quarts a day in these calves. They're always going to start out uh, very conservatively in that first week. It just seems to be a, a, a volume limiting issue no matter how well these calves start off and, and such. Three times a day certainly will help that out. Yeah. Okay, so another way to go about this would be to adjust your milk replacer. So, are we talking about just dumping more powder in, Jerry, or what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, once upon a time we uh, used to just add another half a cup of powder into the same amount of milk or uh, water and think we were doing great guns uh, on these calves until we found out years later that the when you increase the solids concentration in the milk replacer and you get yeah, actually, you get too much over 15%, you can run into issues, particularly if you've got hard water. That's the real uh, real issue. 
when you start to make uh, 17, 18 uh, percent uh, solids milk replacer concoction, you're really concentrating some of the salts in there. You add hard water on top of that that's got iron and sulfur and, and God knows what else. Uh, we really play havoc with the, the calf's guts. Uh, these clostridial bloats and enteritis is quick deaths, uh, at least out our way, where we've got high sulfate stump, uh, spots. Uh, you can see these crop up just like flipping a switch uh, and such. So you do have to be careful of that. So we like to feed more rather than more concentrated. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then how about um, increased starter after about two and a two, two and or two to two and a half weeks? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, we've uh, there's been a been two different camps on feeding calves, particularly when they need more nutrients. One is to get them started on more dry feed because it's cheap for one thing, uh, and spare that that fancy milk replacer that costs you lots of money or uh, you don't have enough waste milk so you have to take it out of the tank mm -hmm. and uh, or feed them more liquid feed as I like to call it and such. So um, the, the problem with starter is that um, the protein in it is plant-based. Calves do not really have an ability to digest plant proteins until they get on to about two and a half weeks of age. Uh, and any of the uh, the grain content in there, the starch from corn, you know, we argue should it be fine ground, should it be steam flaked and all the rest. Well, a calf that's under two, two and a half weeks of age doesn't know what to do with starch anyway, because calves and cows in general don't have the starch digesting enzyme amylase, period. Ruminants digest starch in the rumen when the bugs in the rumen get established, and that certainly doesn't happen in, in very young calves. So, uh, so we really don't need to push starter intake all that much in these calves until they start to get this change in their digestion, which is happens about two, two and a half weeks of age. And so the, you know, all these suggestions are so to offset the, the, the nutritional cost of cold weather. So that the starter feed is in another place where you might be able to increase some of the. Um, nutrients that you're getting into the animals, but not until, as Jerry was saying, after this two weeks of age. Sure, it's just fine to let them nose yep. around in it and know what it is, and some calves will eat a, f a fair amount, but you're never going to expect a two-week-old calf to eat a pound, pound and a half right. of a starter. It just, just, just doesn't happen. It's not realistic. Okay, so then, so all right, so we're talking about increasing their nutritional uh, plane to um, offset the cost of the cold weather on their bodies and their, their metabolism. So the other side of that, though, is water. And so even with increasing the amount of, um, of uh, milk or milk replacer that you're feeding, you know, calves still need to drink between about a, a gallon to two gallons a day, depending on how old they are and how big they are, et cetera. And the key here is that the water, you know, here we are in cold weather, but yet the calves need to drink what we might even call hot water, but warm water anyway, and to be, have it be in front of them at about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So that means heating, if you know, if you're hauling water from somewhere, that means making sure it's good and hot, so that when you get it to the calf, even if it's cooled down a bit, it's still warm water at, at about 80 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. And you know, the um, if you can offer the water within sort of an hour after you've done your feedings, your milk, your milk replacer, that seems to be, uh, a good time and that they'll consume it. You know, we were also talking a little bit earlier about, you know, the whole water thing, make sure it's not, it doesn't freeze up, make sure you empty the, the um, if it does freeze up, you know, just a little bit of ice in the bottom, clean that out. Anything else along those lines, Jerry, set you kind of want cold no, water? I think I mean, the, cold weather, the water. offering soon after they drink, you don't want to do it right on top of, uh, particularly milk feeding because um, milk, whole milk has to curdle in the, the abomasum, and if you, you throw too much water into that mix too soon after, you might interfere with that. Milk replacement is critical, but uh, by the time you get done feeding the calves and you, you get things straightened out, go back and put some nice warm water in there, that's usually a good uh, time interval. Okay. All right, so now we're kind of switching gears a little bit and talking about their environment. Um, we addressed their feeding requirements. So um, let's kind of talk a bit about the actual uh, challenge of the environment around them. So, you know, this is kind of interesting. Uh, let me get this out of the way. So, uh, kind of the uh, quote about air movement, Jerry? 
Yeah, um, and this this kind of Kurt Gooch is the one that actually I remember brought to my attention on this a number of years ago in a in a presentation that he did. And um, uh, thinking about drafts and such, it, it, the, the bottom line is these particularly these younger calves that uh, under three weeks of age, uh, it doesn't require too much of wind movement, mile per hour or greater, to actually be considered a draft on these guys. And this doesn't include a calf that's kind of wet because they're laying in bedding that's that's damp or they're out in a hutch and they've got snow that's blown on top of them and kind of melted on them and that sort of thing so in dry conditions and and under 50 degrees fahrenheit uh and a breeze that's over a mile per hour is considered a draft so we want to uh, we want to keep that in mind as they get a little older they can uh, they can take uh, a little bit more air movement right so you need the air movement, but not as a draft. So how about, you know, some ways to kind of get a, a draft free environment? Hutches, they're got a lot of bedding, right? Hutches are really good. You know, they're not people friendly in the wintertime when the snow's up to your butt, <laughs> but, uh, you know, calves do pretty well. They got their own micro environment in there. And as long as you keep them well bedded and fairly dry, they, they'll do pretty well and feed them enough. Mm -hmm. No. Yep. And so, so that's outside. So inside, okay, so you have wired pens, and uh, panel pens and, you know, the sort of the, uh, the trade-off there between trying to make sure there's uh, air movement, yet at the same time, you know, not making sure that there isn't, they're not getting that draft that we want, we're concerned or, about. Or the panel thing is uh, the fear of nose to nose or butt to right. nose. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Contact <laughs> is spread disease, yeah. No. <laughs> but both of those systems can work, right? Sure, yes. But, yeah. you know, you want to think about that. If, if you've got wire pens, you've got panels, what you can, um, you know, kind of think about the draft situation, but yet are they still getting enough um, air movement at the calf level? And then um, kind of touch on two row barns um, ventilate naturally better than four row barns. Want to comment on that, Jerry? Yeah, uh, we've got a lot of these four row barns we've built over the years out our way, and naturally wise, uh, you know, the outside rows do fairly well, the, the inside rows uh, not, not so well. Um, calves don't make enough heat to actually have uh, ventilators or, or ridges. Ridge vents do very much good unless they're power chimneys and that's that sort of thing. But the, anything that gets over you know, 40 feet wide uh, uh, is is kind of tough to naturally ventilate. Uh, and if and if you are on a hill and the wind prevailing out of the west and you're always guaranteed a breeze, well, the calves on the west side of the barn are going to get half froze by the time the ones on the south side of the barn. Uh, or the east side of the barn actually gets some decent air by them. So mm -hmm. it's, it's it's tough. Right. So, you know, the thing is, even now, it's not too late if you're looking around and seeing that some of these are going to be an issue for you, some of these factors are going to be an issue. You know, I'm not talking about big construction projects, but just if there are things that you can do, better to do it now than when we have a foot of snow or two feet of snow. Yep. So kind of start thinking like, okay, well, it's okay in this weather, but when it's cold, even colder and below freezing, how are we going to address this? And about uh, you know for inside barns, the, the ammonia. Yeah, the uh, the bottom line on on air quality is you know we talk about fresh air. What we're really looking to do is keep particularly the ammonia down. Ammonia is very irritating to the respiratory tract lining, the trachea, uh, the bronchi, and that sort of thing. Uh, in reality, if you can smell ammonia, it's too much. No, that that's your, without all sorts of fancy uh, wind uh, wind velocity deals or uh, anything that detects ammonia and in, in apparatus that you can buy and spend money on. If you can smell it, it's too high, and you got to figure out how to get get by that. Right. Okay. Uh oh, no advancer. There we go. So bedding and cleanliness. So, you know, Jerry already mentioned, you know, wind chill matters if the calves are wet, that the cold is even, you know, it's sort of a double whammy uh, that's going to challenge the, the animal nutrition wise and health wise, et cetera. So, you know, and also mud caked on their, um, on their coat that, you know, kind of, the insulating effect of their their hair coat is uh, diminished if it's been with sure. mud and, mm -hmm. and it. Um, so then, you know, you, even that natural insulation, you've compromised. So kind of looking at it, uh, the calves, make sure that they're dry. And, you know, it does matter whether or not they're clean. So it, it does have an impact. 
So as far as like the wetness, et cetera, straw, you know, is a, is a better insulator than, than sawdust. But, you know, if, if you have sawdust, the thing to do is to work with it and, and uh, make sure that you're using it in a way that um, is effective for keeping the, the cats warm. But if you can get some straw and you have access to that, uh, it really is the better, better way to go. But you need to kind of think about a, a couple of things. So uh, four to six inches deep. Yeah, and these, this nesting score thing, which uh, next slide will show a little bit about that. It's really important. These, these uh, uh, calves like to nestle down into things and kind of get a little bit hidden in it. And it, it also helps the thermal uh, aspect of it when, the, when they get down deeper in the straw and just laying on the top. Yeah. Here, I'll show you with the, uh, oh, it would, oh, here, we'll go for one and go back to that. Um, so nesting score. So this is Dr. Norland in uh, the University of Wisconsin Vet School, and uh, he came up with this uh, method or scoring method for you to uh, kind of look at your bedding situation and your calves and decide if you are where you need to be. So we didn't put all the, the pictures up of each type of score, but we did, the, the picture that you're seeing there is where you need to be for the winter time. It's a nesting score of three, um, means you know that you can't see their legs, they kind of can nestle down in there. You know, it's called a nesting score because they do look just like they're in a nest. So when the weather is not the challenge, when it's not so cold that you're really trying to help the, cow, uh, the calf keep some heat, you know, maybe you don't need to have a, a nesting score of three, but during the winter, for sure, that's where you want to um, keep your calves at, clean, dry, and so that it can nestle in there. And don't forget jackets. Uh, oh, yeah, jack right, jackets, right. Jackets uh, will give these calves a significant degree difference. I've heard people say maybe 10, 15 degree uh, ability, uh, meaning that uh, a calf with a jacket on at 10 degrees uh, is the equivalent of a calf without a jacket at, say, 25 degrees. So it, it makes a difference. When do you take them off? Most people that uh, pay attention to say when the calf outgrows the jacket and you can't keep it on anymore, mm -hmm. so that's time to take it off. Right. And so you, you can buy jackets, you can make them, you know, the um, people have taken a different approach on, uh, on how to go about having them, but uh, definitely worth the time. How about cleaning them in between? Yeah, it's a good idea because they'll get dirty and such and calves spend, uh, I forget there was a study years ago, they spend something like 7% of the day licking around them or on themselves, their legs and whatever. Okay. So, so anything that's in tongue, tongue reach needs to be clean, including yes. that calf coat. Right. So between calves, that's when you need to clean them? Yes. There, you think? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Unless they're really mucky or something. Right. But, sure. know, just just on, like on a bucket a, or something. Right. Like right. Anyway. Okay. I think we can go back. Nope. All right, so we also, we were talking about clean, so let's talk a little bit about um, disinfectants. Yeah, disinfectants, um, you know, it should be an important part of, uh, of hygiene, uh, whether it's uh, hutches or in a, in a uh, concrete floor in, uh, inside the barn and that sort of thing. Uh, one thing to keep in mind with disinfectants is that you really need to remove the dirt and any organic matter that's on, on it to begin with. Uh, Something's crusted on there and you put in a disinfectant, spray it on. Hopefully it's on there for a little while or you set it into something to soak. If you don't get the dirt and the, and the crud off, you're not going to sanitize down below that stuff. The other thing to remember about disinfectants, doesn't matter if it's Clorox or Penasol or uh, any of these uh, uh, type of products that you can buy out there, they don't kill everything. There's always survivors in here. So what we're doing is cutting down on the risk and this logarithmic reduction deal uh, means like Clorox particularly will kill like 10, 10 to the power of three it means it'll cut things down by a thousandth of what there was there before but there's still a lot of survivors uh, bacteria and, and such. Uh, you have to be careful of disinfectants are affected by the temperature some are more particular by concentration. You know, if you think you can get there, well, I use half the concentration and I'll be all right. Well, some of them don't do diddly do when you cut them down past their labeled uh, concentration. pH of the water can matter. Hardness of the water can be uh, impact. And uh, again, the presence of organic matter. So this is one thing, read the label. You may be using the wrong product in the situation uh, that you're using it for. All right, so now we're going to kind of uh, 
switch gears again and talk about cash health and disease. Yep. This uh, little scale here is just kind of symbolic of um, the the balance uh, that health disease, you know, it's 50% 50 full or empty, whichever you want to look at it, on um, disease and health. There's a lot of things that go into here. And so we're really going to talk about like disease, you know, immunity and such. Um, so there's a lot of things that go together. Hit enter. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I've used this little diagram thing for a long time. So uh, the health status is really, there's kind of three pillars that go. And this is for any animal, whether it's a calf heifer or uh, older cow. Or, or humans doesn't make any difference. You know, historically we looked at disease as being the result of exposure to a pathogen. And, um, uh, but we, we know that just because you're exposed to something does not mean you're gonna get the disease that's associated with that, that pathogen. So the things that really make a difference is whether you succumb to a disease or not is uh, stress uh, is a big one. And in this uh, stress, I have environment over that. So in, in calves, uh, a lot of their stress is related to the environment, that wet, that cold, uh, a draft, uh, how rough we are with handling them, how isolated they feel, or social critters, if they can't really see another calf, all these panel pens and that sort of thing, they, they can hear but they can't see so well, that, that's a stress. Uh, nutrition is really important on baby calves uh, because it, it feeds the, uh, the immune system. If a calf has to keep the, the lights on and, and uh, maintain its body, its functions, it wants to grow a little bit, and then you also want it to uh, uh, keep its immune system up, you really have to provide decent nutrition to these animals. So uh, you may have one of these three pillars if you want be not too good, maybe you'll survive. You have two out of the three not so hot, you're probably going to be guaranteed that you're going to have, uh, have a health issue. So it's, uh, this is where this balance uh, comes into play. When you take a look at uh, what kills calves, um, and if you open up calves and do necropsies and such, there's two things that are commonly found. Doesn't matter if they die of respiratory, uh, digestive scours, or some other kind of infectious thing. Dehydration and undernutrition uh, are two big things. If you ever send anything off to Cornell, a lot of times they'll come back, they'll say cachectic, which means uh, very undernutrition. The picture uh, that you see there is a picture of the intestinal tract, and the thing you'll notice, there is no fat. Uh, loops of bowel are usually surrounded by and layered in fat. This specimen here has absolutely none. Very common finding, especially in the wintertime, when animals go down and die of uh, either, particularly scours, but it can be a respiratory disease as well. Wanted to add this in. Oh, I forgot to. Um, one of the things that at any time you have to worry about is what the metabolic impact of dystocia, calving difficulties are. Uh, really, until recent years, this has not been a big focus and quite underrated. Uh, so all these things, when a calf is, uh, has a difficult time coming out, we have to pull with a lot of force, calf jack, two, three people yanking on the calf, whatever. We have a lot of physical trauma. The blood oxygen levels drop off pretty good because the, the cord being pinched or prematurely broken or something. And we get all these other things that go on here. But the big deal is hypothermia. Uh, these, uh, any calf, any time of the year, if it's not terribly hot, will actually cool down uh, after a difficult calving. Uh, if the core body temperature gets down below 101 degrees for uh, up towards about an hour, we have a real serious impact on how this calf responds to disease challenge. Uh, the immune system just doesn't seem to work so well. The absorption of uh, antibodies from the colostrum isn't so good and whatever. And, and just by logic, in the wintertime, when we've had a really severely cold night calf's born wet, it shivers, maybe it lays out there, it's got a draft on it in the calving area, whatever, uh, it's very easy for these calves to, to chill out and get into this, this situation. So the things that we were talking about, just cold weather uh, for calf raising, starts right here at, yeah, at this, calving. Yeah, this one's at birth, you know, this yep. is a little special scenario, but yep. uh, very important. Okay, one thing we have to keep in mind with these little guys is that uh, thing called active immunity, you know, what the animal can do for itself when challenged by a disease. 
Uh, cams are born with about a quarter of the level of the machinery, if you will. I got all the stuff in place, but it doesn't work so good because these cams have never been challenged by anything. So um, uh, we only have a limited response in that first seven to 10 days of life, very dependent on colostral antibodies and keeping this, the, the calf's nutritional plane up to a point where they can develop this, this active uh, immunity. So uh, this is the kind of pathway that vaccines use or just natural exposure. But we have to keep in mind that despite the, the advancing age of a calf, it's really no guarantee that that immune system is really progressing the way it should if the nutrition is poor and the stresses aren't controlled. So even though by two, three weeks of age, we'd expect calves to start to develop their own immune system fairly well, if they are really challenged, they may be no better off than that calf that's four or five days of age. We have to keep that in mind. So just a little bit on scours. You know, scours is kind of almost a point of view in a way. Uh, and uh, how do you feed your calves? How much do you feed your calves? Do you feed water uh, to these younger calves uh, uh, after they're, they're fed their, their milk or milk replacer? Uh, particularly winter or summer, uh, that kind of uh, whitish looking uh, plop in the upper left hand corner uh, has a fair amount of consistency in it. You might say, well, the color is not right and, uh, and that, but it's got pretty good consistency. The one on the lower right in the bucket is kind of splashy and such, but we have to consider how much uh, liquid feed these calves are getting and how much water they're, they're given. You know, years ago, we never fed water to calves until they're practically weaned. The only water they got was through the milk or the milk replacer. We expected a stiffer kind of manure in calves. And when it got a little bit splashy, we were convinced that they had some scours. Well, uh, not with these high feeding rates and, and access to water, uh, more like that in that pail might, might be more of a normal in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, scours is one of these crap shoots, you, you know, uh, you've got a calf or calves that are get seven to 10 days of age and they seem to all go through a little bit of uh, bout with the scours. Maybe they're not that sick and maybe just little electrolytes and you get them through it and such. Well, when you look at the common uh, causes of scours all in left, E. coli, clostridium, salmonella, all that through the rodent coronavirus, uh, you can see there's a whole bunch of them. And if you look at that upper uh, column, uh, you day 10 is circled at the bottom. Look at all the things that can happen to a calf around day 10. Uh, I mean, it can have clostridium, it can have E. coli, it can have salmonella, uh, rotocoronavirus, uh, crypto can be in there and such. So really, you know, which, which of those is the cause or how many of those are the cause though is the question and such. So very common thing. And that's why getting these calves off to a good start on that left-hand side from day zero to five, where we treat them well, minimize the stress, and give them pretty much a high level of, of uh, liquid feed to get everything going well is, is really, uh, really important. Uh, my old friend, Sam Ledley, who works out of my old practice in, in Attica, uh, coined the phrase bacterial soup a long time ago. Uh, we think uh, traditionally of, of pathogens and bad things, particularly scour bugs, coming out of the environment. that comes out of the, the surfaces of the, the manure from a neighboring calf or on a, a panel or hog wire that's not cleaned well or something like that. But we really have to look at the, the, the liquid feed that's going to these calves and what is used to, to collect it to store it, to mix it, and to feed it out. Uh, this is where we have lots of opportunities out there to, uh, to cause some, some, some issues. Um, uh, this can go from uh, one, uh, a long, a wide range of, of, of issues and how fast and how severe these scours come on. Probably the, the, the quickest and the most dramatic is when we have colostrum that is, col that is harvested and is loaded with uh, nasty E. coli bacteria because we didn't clean the teats of these fresh cows off well enough, or we milked the cow, the stuff sat in a pail for a couple of hours somewhere before we poured it off and gave it to the calves or put it in the fridge or something or other. Uh, so these really early scours by day two of age where these calves got the screaming diarrhea and such indicates that they had one whopping load 
of bad bugs uh, early on in their lives, as opposed to the calves that start coming on with something seven to 10 days of age, it gets a little bit, little bit gets worse and worse. Maybe we have an incremental load of, of nasty bugs that's going in through the, the feeding uh, that we haven't controlled by good sanitation on the pails, the nipples, the whisks, whatever touches the, the liquid feed. All righty. At the bottom of that slide, you can see that the, the nasty bugs E. coli have a very short generation time. So at room temperature above, they make a new generation about every 20 minutes. So uh, it's easy to see that if something sets out at uh, room temperature for a few hours uh, and you have kind of contaminated stuff to begin with, whether it's waste milk or colostrum, you're going to have quite an issue when you feed this to calves. Freezing it is not going to do anything about it. Uh, they'll just put them in suspended animation. They'll come back to life with the feed. <laughs> so freezing is not, not the answer. I want to mention quick on antibiotics. Uh, with the veterinary feed directive uh, looming here the first of the year, this is not going to change some, at least uh, added to the feed and to milk and milk replacer antibiotics and such. Um, we've been under the misconception for a long time that uh, antibiotics actually do us lots of good in scour situations. Um, there might be some situations that it does, and that would be the ones that uh, the, the bacteria, like the salmonellas in particular, would go systemic rather rapidly. Once the, the causative agent of this diarrhea uh, breaks that barrier between the gut and the blood and gets into the, the bloodstream, we've got a different issue. That's where antibiotics do, do the most good. Uh, to combat something that's in the intestinal tract, particularly as an injectable product, is, is probably uh, wishful thinking. Uh, oral antibiotics uh, may or may not do anything. Uh, neomycin, tetracycline, that sort of thing, probably are much better preventative uh, on this than they are um, as a treatment. So we really want to rely on electrolytes and what they call symptomatic treatment, maybe a little banamine here and there, something like that, rather than, uh, than antibiotics. All right, let's go on to the next one. Let's see, what do we got next here? All right, just a little quick thing on respiratory diseases. Um, my take on this is if you have pneumonia in your calves that are less than three weeks of age, uh, you uh, probably don't have as much problem with a contagious bug as you do the or maybe the uh, 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 blood selenium levels, which isn't really as common as it was, say, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, maybe you've got a really ventilate, poor ventilation issue, a lot of ammonia uh, built up. Maybe you've got airborne allergens. Uh, you got to keep in mind the calves are kind of like us. When you've got some sort of bed, uh, bell buster or you're shaking up very dusty sawdust or something in their presence, that when they, they inhale this, uh, they have the same tendency to uh, cause irritation in the respiratory tract as it would with us. And so massive exposures to this uh, airborne allergen is not a good thing. It can set you up for some respiratory issues. Always keep in mind uh, tube feeders that if improperly used and you dribble out liquid as it comes out of the calf's uh, stomach, that uh, they can inhale this. And don't forget the large uh, nipples on, on bottles that, uh, you know, they're, they're meant for chugging rather than real, you know, drinking. <laughs> Uh, calves don't take to, especially young calves, to a large flow through one of these nipples. It should have been replaced a month ago. Uh, coxy coccidiosis is something that uh, should be kept in control, period, but it can be one of these debilitating diseases, particularly at transition to from weaning, uh, that will predispose them to some respiratory diseases. And just to make all you old timer folks like me feel good, that cold, it's been proven that cold air increases the penetration of microbes into the lung. So our grandmother was right years ago to stay away from those drafts. <laughs> okay. uh, wanted to mention um, this one here. This 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 always just drove me crazy, particularly in practice. That uh, animals in the winter that get uh, that get itchy, that have all these nice little uh, tongue licks all over them and such that that people for years tell me that was because in the winter time the skin gets dry and itchy and whatever. Well, that one is a wives' tale. 
That's a <laughs> grandpa says kind of deal. If you have itchy animals, calves, heifers, it is lice, folks. It is not itchy skin that needs some sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, and cream or something like that uh, on them. Uh, it can be a big issue. Uh, these animals, uh, lice tend to bloom when the weather gets cold. Uh, they're kind of difficult to eliminate. Uh, the ones we worry about are the sucking lice, not the biting lice. The biting lice will drive an animal crazy, but the sucking lice can can drain them actually of blood and make them anemic. Each one of these sucking lice can drink about a quarter of a or a tenth of a milliliter of blood a day, and it's nothing to find a thousand or better of these things uh, on, a, on a, even a young animal. So uh, it's something to take care of. Uh, lots of products out there. My favorite is the older uh, Ibamec type porons that are alcohol based. You can use them at a fraction of the dose for warming and actually control these lice for for up to three or four months if you do it uh, after Thanksgiving, early December when you start up. Put a plug in for diagnostics. Um, I had someone call me up the other day uh, on a kind of a strange situation. They'd lost, I don't know how many goats and how many horses and all the rest. And they had two veterinarians in there over the last two or three years. And when I asked what kind of diagnostics they had, they had some animals went up to Cornell, but when it came to asking, well, what'd you get for lab reports? They were like silent on the phone. So um, the point is uh, the best use of particularly a dead animal is to do a necropsy and find out what's going on. Uh, save the, lot, the, the living ones by sacrificing, even sacrificing an animal that isn't dead yet, that's looking like it's going that way. Those are really the best candidates to get you some really good uh, information on tissue samples, blood samples have taken off. When an animal dies, you've got a relatively short period of time to really get good tissues off to the lab uh, and such. So um, work, you've got to work with your veterinarian. Uh, you have to be willing to spend some money. Uh, veterinarians don't just like doing necropsies. I'll, I'll testify to that, particularly when it's uh, summer and things smell pretty bad. <laughs> and you've got a 1,500 pound cow that you're up to your armpits in. Not a, not a good thing but sometimes you, you need to do that. All righty. Well, I guess that's it. I think we hit it right on time here. Yeah, Quarter we did. Wow. We did. So we, we can hopefully take a question or two if people want to hang on. We're, we've got time uh, yep. about the, the audience. Yeah, so please um, go ahead and put some questions in the chat box or yeah. if, uh, let me see. Oh, we got some stuff there. There. I'm not even here. Uh oh, we should have looked at this before. <laughs> Holy moly! Um, so, folks, if um, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box. Or if um, you're so inclined, go ahead and unmute yourself, and uh, we'll wait a couple of minutes for questions. Either everybody's mystified, or we have no connection. <laughs> No, the other side of it takes a couple of seconds to type in. So we'll give them <laughs> give them a minute. There we go. Okay, so the question is, what are the best options and considerations to transport oh. new transport new calves from maternity barn? to hutch or calf born. Yeah, uh, let me take that one. Um, okay. I was just doing a little workup for uh, the upcoming calf and heifer congress that I'm a co-chair on, the thing we have in Syracuse every year. They have a, a larger dairy that has these great, um, their water tubs that they've mounted on uh, nice, fairly large rubber wheels. And uh, they actually put the calves in these things, feed them in their colostrum to dip their navels right in these tubs and they put them under heat lamps and their calf barn isn't all that far from mm -hmm. the calving area and where they put these calves in the tubs and they wheel them right down to the calf barn. And so they're, they're mm -hmm. kind of nestled in there. They mm -hmm. put some straw on the bottom. And I think that's probably the best thing I've mm -hmm. seen, you know, rather than a wheelbarrow or the back of the gator, or whatever it is, it's, it, you have to have it so you can clean it out. Mm -hmm. uh, if nothing, you've got the mouth and you've got the navel that are, are really apt to get exposed to, to stuff that, that they shouldn't. Uh, the navel is pretty much wide open. 
even if you dip it with iodine, you, you still have the opportunity to get some contamination there. Yeah. Okay. So we have a question about refractometers. Which is a, what are the benchmarks for milk versus? Yeah, for for uh, you're talking as solids uh, you're using refractometer. Yep. Uh, let's see. So whereas colostrum, we're talking about like 22, 23 on a uh, Brits refractometer. Uh, whole milk and milk replace are going to be down there, and I'm going to I'm going to claim a little ignorance on the differences in some of these milk replacers uh, as far as how they show. Because I think we're going to see some difference. Uh, these refractometers are usually based on protein, uh, so we will see, depending on what kind of milk replacer you have, it, it could it could vary. So uh, that's going to have to be a manufacturer question there. Uh, someone who's had the experience with a particular, whether it's 20 percent, 22, or 26, that what it should read. Okay. So it says here, is there a recommended amount to increase milk fed in the winter? How much should it be? Yeah, it's kind of a sliding scale. Uh, generally, you can consider that once you get down to freezing 32 degrees, you're probably going to need at least a quarter to a third more of energy anyway. Uh, and when you get down to zero, we're, we're really looking at practically doubling of the, the energy requirement for, for calves. Uh, so uh, that's kind of a thumb rule on that. There are some charts um, that I'm trying to think where you could access, whether the Pro Dairy website, whether it's Mike Van Amberg stuff. I think it's in there. Yeah. It, it, if you do a search, Van Amberg feeding calves, feeding levels, winter, um, there is a chart that comes yeah, up. Yeah. There's one that's been around for a while. Yeah. A lot of people use. Yeah. You know, I almost put it in the slides set and then I didn't I, do it. I thought about it too, but okay. I guess. Okay, and then the, the last two more questions, but vaccination to prevent pneumonia, that's something you'd recommend? Yeah, what do you think? well, vaccine, that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, you know, there's no, no two farms should really have the same vaccination program because nobody has the same history, nor the same environmental conditions, uh, feeding program, and, and that sort of thing. Um, I, I think there should be basic vaccines related to pneumonias, but primarily related to the, to the viruses, IBR, PI3, BV, uh, BRSV, BVD, and such. When you start talking about vaccinating for uh, Pasteurella or Mannheimia or Histophilus, which used to be Haemophilus, um, it gets into some murky territory there. Um, so generally, my, I would rather go into a situation and kind of find out what's going on what the challenges might be and maybe do some diagnostics to figure out what you've got. You might have mycoplasma, mycoplasma vaccines, uh, some of the solid dose technology that's coming out on vaccines is looking uh, promising on mycoplasma, but heretofore that's been a, uh, not a very good one to try to make a autogenous vaccine or a commercially available one. So uh, can't make a blanket recommendation. Now, if, if you want to do something like Enforce 3, which is a good Zoetis product. Uh, that's an intranasal. Uh, that's a pretty good, uh, just generic kind of uh, protection, particularly on younger calves. Uh, it has a broad spectrum as far as helping the immune system on the surface in the, the lung tissues and in the trachea to actually defend itself against a lot of things, not just the, the three viruses uh, that are in there. So uh, that's a little bit different than the conventional uh, injectable antibiotics. And TSV2, those kind of things that are old, nasomune, the older ones, so similar kind of idea. Not as comprehensive, though. Okay, so we have someone who's asking, is it still suggested to give selenium shots to newborns, especially brown stuff? Ooh, okay. Well, I'm going to claim a little ignorance. I've only had one or two herds in practice ever had worked with that Swiss. I don't, it's, it's the, if the reference is here, the Swiss have some sort of reaction to, mm -hmm. to uh, Musi, Bosi, or that sort of thing. I guess I don't remember that, my practical experience. But um, I, I still recommend uh, newborn uh, selenium supplementation, whether it's uh, the relatively newer product, Multimin, which is not only selenium, but it's manganese, 
zinc and copper. I kind of like that one. Uh, I always use Musi in baby cams. You've got to be a little more careful of it. This is CC. You don't want to go too high because the selenium is kind of high versus BOC, which is uh, only a fifth of the dose of selenium as Musi is. But I still like those newborn shots. Uh, they will get a pretty good slug of selenium from the colostrum, but I think uh, I, I think there's a benefit to uh, that extra supplementation by a needle, if you will. Okay. Any research on the relationship between dry cow diet and management and calf? Oh, yeah. Um, the cow does her best to actually help its its uh, its offspring, uh, the uh, calf in utero, uh, answer the colostrum and such. But there are uh, there are kind of limitations. Uh, if you severely restrict things like uh, particularly uh, quality proteins to to dry cows, pre fresh cows and such, you can impact quality of colostrum. Uh, you also impact the overall uh, metabolic function and health of, the, of that that cow or heifer when she when she comes fresh. So you got to remember there's two two things that you primarily have to worry about with this cow and the calf that's, that's going to be born. One is what this cow is going to give to that calf in utero, which is usually pretty good. These cows will short themselves on things to make sure the, the, the fetus does pretty well. On the other side, and the, the, the colostrum is part of that, but the other side of it is uh, if this cow is kind of stressed out uh, nutritionally, she may tend to be under a little bit more metabolic stress and maybe she's going to shed things right around calving at a higher level than what she would have if everything was just nice and she was happy and she she had the proper uh, uh, nutrition and was not stressed out too much. So got to worry about these cows polluting that calf environment because no matter how quick you are to get a calf out of the calving pen or if you calve out even in a, a tie stall barn, you put uh, a gutter grate in there and you put some straw bales around or something, you know, we still have a, a certain amount of time that calf's going to be in that quote cow environment before we get it out of there. So, yeah, so the diet, uh, this uh, prenatal care on, on cows does make a difference. Okay, I think that's a lot of questions. We did have someone ask um, where you can view the recording of today's presentation. Just pro dairy dairy webinars. Up, oh, Jerry says I think I think we missed one. No, no. Is there a recommendation? No, I guess we're all right. All right. Okay. Yep. Think we're good. Okay, so, that, so once again, thanks all for uh, for joining us. And Jerry, great job. Thanks very, very much. It was fun to be here. Yep. And um, so again, you know, um, again, appreciate your taking the time to, to listen. And uh, everybody should have a good day then. Okay. Bye now.